welcome to River Oaks Presbyterian Church. I got all these kids dressed up and Cookie Monsters and whatnot. Um, our kids this morning, just to watch the wonder and joy in their face of dressing up and getting to be their favorite characters, just reminded me of why we were here and to find wonder and joy in our Savior. And so as we prepare our hearts for that, would you stand with me and hear the call to worship? Come from Jude, chapter 20, verse 24 and 25. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy, to the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ our Lord, be glory and majesty and dominion and authority before all time and now and forevermore. Amen. Do you pray with me? Father, we do wonder at how ama- amazing you are, at your majesty and your glory, that you would reveal yourself to us. And so we come here looking to experience, and to understand, and to know and hear how great you are in all that you give us and all that you do. And remember that as we pray together, as you taught your disciples to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
500 years ago on October 31st, Martin Luther uh, wrote 95 theses or proposals and nailed them to the door of a seminary. And the first thesis he wrote said this, said, when our Lord and Master Jesus Christ said, repent, he willed the entire life of believers to be one of repentance. And so we take the time every week to repent, confess our sins before the Lord as we enter into worship. Let's do that now. Oh, Lord, our God, you were the one who came to break oppression, to set the captives free. We were the captives who were enslaved to sin until you rescued us. And now you call us to love each other with brotherly affection, with sisterly affection to outdo one another in showing honor, and to abhor what is evil, but hold fast to what is good. But Father, we confess that too often we fail to love each other because we're so focused on our own wants and our own needs. We don't outdo one another in showing honor because we're too busy grasping at the titles of honor and respect for ourselves. And because we're consumed with ourselves, Lord, we give the evil one a foothold in our lives. But thanks be to God that you don't give up on us, but continue to mold us into your image and sanctify us through the trials and tribulations of life. And so we pray, Holy Spirit, that you would teach us to love more deeply as Christ loved us and held fast to that rugged cross in order to honor and serve us and to keep the evil one from having dominion in our lives and in this church. We pray this to the glory of God. Amen. Now, having confessed our sins, please stand and hear this good news. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. Amen.
Amen. Thank you so much. Please be seated. And while the kitty cats and the uh, queens and the stormtroopers leave us, let me let you know that we do have children's church up to the third grade. So if you want to take your children out, there will be someone in the lobby uh, to meet them and to escort them to their classes. And while they're doing that, let me make just a couple of announcements. We do have little fellowship pads on the ends of the rows. If you want to take those and use those as a way to give us your information so we can reach out to you and tell you more about our church, we would love to do that. If you don't want to do that, you are welcome to stay anonymous. Uh, if you would also like to pass those down so that our members could give us their prayer requests, we, uh, we pray through those at our staff meetings on Mondays and keep those with us through the week so we can be praying for you, uh, and we love to do that. I have a couple of announcements. Uh, first, if you uh, want to know more about our church, it's not too late to come to the new members class. It's at, uh, in the other end of the parking lot in the uh, Youth and Activities building. It'll be right after this uh, worship service at 12, and we will have uh, lunch. We'll have, I think, pizza today and um, a chance just to kind of get to know each other. And it's really when I'm going to be teaching about uh, the doctrine that's at the heart of our church, and so I hope you can come. Uh, I, I usually have a small group or a, a community group at my house on Sunday nights, every other Sunday night, uh, but today I'm having a new members class instead. So if you want to just get to know me better and visit me uh, at my community group, come to new members class. You don't, there's no, uh, there is no um, obligation, and I will give you a piece of pizza and visit with you uh, then instead of uh, this evening. So please take, a, uh, take that opportunity. Also, we have a prayer group that meets uh, in our um, in our CE room at 8.30 every Sunday morning. If you have prayers that you want them to, to be praying for you, or if you want to come and pray with them, that's every Sunday morning uh, at 8.30. And then finally on Thursday nights at 6.30 in the CE room again, we have a single and parenting class that uh, we're very proud of. It's a, it's a group uh, for those who, because of divorce or death or something else, have found themselves parenting by themselves, parenting as a single parent. And it's a, it's a support group. It's an information group. Uh, it's a big encouragement. And if you or someone else you know have found yourself in that place, we'd love for you to come. Uh, if you would like to help minister to people who have found themselves in that place, we'd love for you to come. So I think that's all for my announcements right now. And I think the parents are back. So let's pray, and then we'll get started. Our Father in heaven, we come to you this morning excited to uh, be welcomed into your gates, be uh, welcomed into your throne room. We come to you this morning uh, anxious because of big things that are happening this week, and we don't know if we are, uh, are good enough or we will uh, be able to do everything we're, we're asked to do. We come to you, Father, uh, angry over things that happened last week that didn't go the way we thought. They ought to go. We come to you, Father, with every possible emotion, sad, grieving. And we come to you because you, the Lord of the universe, have made clear that you see us and you know us and you care about us. And that's why we cast our worries upon you, because you care for us. Help us to believe that you are that kind of Father. And now, Father, trusting you to take our anxieties so we can we can let go of them. We ask that you would allow us to hear your word with a clear heart, with a stilled and quieted soul. Speak for your servants listen. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, what are we celebrating tomorrow night? That's right, we're celebrating Halloween. How many of you knew that? Uh, probably all of you. You know, that's a very important holiday. I want you to know uh, Halloween's gotten a bad rap in the last few decades. Uh, it's a very important holiday for you to celebrate. It's the day we celebrate uh, All Hallows' Eve. It's the day that 
that Christians for centuries have gotten together and to say the souls of our loved ones who have gone on, they are not in the grave. They are not in purgatory. They're not in hell. They are with Christ, and we celebrate that. Satan did not win, and for whatever reason, they picked November 1st to celebrate that, so October 31st was always the day they would they would get together and throw parties. They would wear masks, supposedly, to poke fun at Satan and to say, you didn't win. You didn't win. Our loved ones are with Christ. They're safe. And, and that's an important day. Uh, it's also an important day because, as Jonathan mentioned, uh, there was a German monk named Martin Luther. Now, Martin Luther was an interesting case. Uh, he had uh, a scholar's mind. He was just incredibly intelligent. But he also had a very tender conscience. And uh, one day he was scared during a, uh, a lightning storm, was convinced that he's going to die. And uh, he wasn't ready to stand before the Lord. And, and he promised St. Anne if she would protect him, she would go to a monastery. And his life became this one long search to know that he was, he was good before the Lord, that he was forgiven. And he could not ever get there. It was never enough. He, he took vows of celibacy, he put on the hair shirt, he, he got the embarrassing haircut. The haircut is supposed to be embarrassing. It's a humiliating thing. Uh, he got all, did all the stuff. He went to Rome and he climbed the staircase, the marble staircase there, the holy, uh, the holy steps. And uh, he climbed every one of the steps on his knees and on each stair he would say the Lord's Prayer. And, and when he finally got to the top, he said he stood up and he said, asked, I wonder if that helped. Who knows? And walked off. And he would, his tender conscience kept getting the best of him. And he, he, he believed that he had to save himself through penance. He had to be good enough. He had to be sorry enough for his sins. But he started asking himself, well, what if I'm only trying to be sorry enough so that I can get into heaven? Isn't that a selfish reason to be sorry? So he'd be sorry about that. And what if I'm only confessing my sins so I can get into hell, heaven? That's a selfish reason. So he began to confess that he was confessing out of selfishness. And then why did he confess that? And he got into these infinite spirals so badly that, that the priest, when the priest would see him come and he would shut the door of the confessional and run off, he didn't want to spend hours in there listening to Martin's sins. And, 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 and nothing was good enough. And so finally someone introduced Martin Luther to the uh, mystic tradition. It's not about works. It's not about penance. It's about love. Just love the Lord. Just love Him. And Martin tried that, but he's like, well, what if my love's not sincere enough? What if my love's not pure enough? Well, am I really... I mean, y'all have all heard the thing, right? I mean, if you ask Jesus into your heart and you mean it, but what if I didn't mean it? Did I mean it enough? And that never satisfied him. And, and one of his... Uh, teachers invited him to begin, te to begin teaching at the seminary, and, and he did. And as he taught through the Psalms, he began to learn more of God's heart. And then he was uh, opening up a semester where he was going to teach on Romans. And he could not get over verses 16 and 17. Verse 16, Paul says, I'm not ashamed of the good news of God, for it is the power of God unto salvation. In it... Verse 17, in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith unto faith. The righteousness of God. That phrase terrified Martin Luther. The righteousness of God means justice. It means his, he, him being so pure that he cannot look upon sin. It means that everything has to be right. And he was terrified by God's righteousness. He was terrified by the word. How could that be good news? That the righteousness, the wrath, the holiness, the, the, the purity of God's being revealed, how can that be good news? And he studied, and he studied, and he came to Romans 4 um, as he went through the book. And in Romans 4, he, he finds these words from the Apostle Paul. To the one who does not work but believes in him who justifies the ungodly. His wages are not counted as a gift. Oh, I'm sorry. His wages is counted. His faith is counted as righteousness. And he realizes that the righteousness of God that is revealed from heaven is the righteousness of Christ that's given to us. It's given to us. And we receive it. 
And that became his hallmark doctrine that he preached about and that he nailed to the door of the, of the cathedral, of the seminary, and, and started the Reformation that, that the righteousness of God is received by faith. And that's what we're talking about today in, in Galatians 3. We, we're talking about this righteousness of God. And the, and the question that I want us to answer is how? How do we become righteous? How do we become right? How do we become what we were created to be? Holy, happy, complete, full, at peace. At peace with God, at peace with man. How do we become that? And the answer is that the gospel way of righteousness is to receive, to rest, and to rejoice in the righteousness of Christ that is given to us. The, the way of becoming righteousness, the way of becoming righteous is to receive, to rest, and rejoice in the righteousness of Christ that's given to us. Please stand as we read from Galatians chapter 3, beginning with verse 1. We're going to go through verse 14. This is the very center uh, of this, this letter. We're going to keep talking about it until we, we, we've covered it. Sometimes I'll just leave things off and say, ah, I'll get it next, next, time, next series, but not, not here. We're, we're, we're going we're gonna to finish this one as long as it takes. Hear the word of the Lord. O oh, foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? It was before your eyes that Jesus Christ was publicly portrayed as crucified. So let me ask you only this. Did you receive the Spirit by works of the law or by hearing with faith? Are you so foolish? Having begun by the Spirit, are you now being perfected by the flesh? Did you suffer so many things in vain, if indeed it was in vain? Does he who supplies the Spirit to you and works miracles among you do so by works of the law or by hearing with faith? Just as Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness, know then that it is those of faith who are the sons of Abraham. And in Scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, he preached the gospel beforehand to Abraham, saying, In you shall all the nations be blessed. So then those who are of faith are blessed along with Abraham, the man of faith. For all who rely on works of the law are under a curse. For it is written, Cursed be everyone who does not abide by all the things written in the book of the law and do them. Now it is evident that no one is justified before God by the law, for the righteous shall live by faith. But the law is not of faith, rather the one who does them shall live by them. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is everyone who is hanged on a tree, so that in Christ the blessing of Abraham might come to the Gentiles, so that we might receive the promised Spirit through faith. Thus far the reading of God's word, all men are like grass, and all of our glory is like the flowers of the field, and the grass withers and the flowers fall, but not God's word. God's word stands forever. You may be seated. The gospel way of righteousness, the way we become holy, the way we become acceptable to God, is to receive, rest in, and rejoice in the righteousness that he gives us the righteousness of Christ given to us. Um, what, what, is that, what does this mean? Well, Paul asks this question. He says, okay, you've begun in the Spirit. You, you, you were saved by, by belief. You know that. You know one's going to be saved by keeping the law. We know that. We, we, we've covered that. And yet you're, you're going back to the law. You're going back to your own efforts. And, and, and he says, did you receive the Spirit? He asks all these questions. Did you receive the Spirit by faith or by works of the law? Are you so foolish? Having begun by the Spirit, are you now going to com complete yourself or perfect yourself by effort? Now, there are three things in there we have to look at. First of all, he says, having begun by the Spirit. And that just demands a, a question. Have you begun by the Spirit? Have you? 
I mean, that's step one, he says. This is how you begin. You begin by the Spirit. You receive the Spirit at salvation. Have you, you know, that, that you, you began that way. And, and we have to ask, well, did we? Are we at church because that's what you do to become a good person? And, and we kind of feel bad about some things we did this week. And we want to feel better about ourselves. And, and, and so we go hear a good motivational speech speech and, and feel better about ourselves and go into this week and we're going to do better, we're going to be good, uh, or have you received the Spirit? Now, receiving the Spirit is a hard thing. It's a hard phrase to understand. Um, the closest thing I can uh, relate it to is Texas A&M football. Okay, Texas A&M people. Yeah. Y'all know that we consider you a cult. And we really do. I mean, everybody else kind of looks at Texas A&M. They get there at midnight in the stadium, and they do their little yell practice and have their fires and do their dances and do their rituals. And everybody on the outside is like, that's weird. They're a cult. And uh, I had this conversation with Blake Altman, who's the pastor in Owasso, and and I said, Blake, you know, everybody else thinks y'all are just weird. And he said, that's A&M. If you didn't go, you can't understand it. And if you did go, you can't explain it. And uh, I was like, that's good. That's what we call a cult. Um, but that's kind of like the Holy Spirit, oddly enough. I'm obviously not a cult, but the Holy Spirit... If you're in the Spirit, if the Spirit is in you, you know. You don't have to question. You don't wonder, gee, I wonder if I'm in the Holy Spirit. You know. You're a different person than you were. You're different. You want to be with God's people. You want to be in, in Him, with Him. You want to, to, to fellowship with Him. The things that you didn't enjoy doing, you now enjoy. And, and if you're not in the Holy Spirit, then you're maybe sitting there going, I wonder if I'm in the Holy Spirit. And the answer is probably not. And if you're not, then trying real hard is not the way to get there. You get there by asking. You get there by asking. You, Jesus is, freely gives. Everyone who comes to me, I will freely give. If anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and out of his and, and drink, and out of your belly will flow rivers of living water. That's the he said that considering the Spirit, concerning the Spirit, John says. And you see how, what, what that requires to ask? It requires humility. It requires saying, okay, I can't do this. This is not, you know, this is not aerobics. I'm not going to come and make myself better. It's just humble. It's helpless. You just ask. Asking is hard. Asking is, is humiliating. You just ask. But that's how you start. That is how you start. And Paul asked the question, well, having started by the Spirit, are you so foolish as to think you're going to perfect it by effort? What's the answer to that question? Yes, we are that foolish, Paul. We think we're going to perfect it by our efforts. You know, we, we, we think that Jesus got us off the hook for all the bad things we did in the past, and now we're going to be better, and we're not going to make those mistakes again. We are, we, we've got it right now, and we're going to go to church, and we're going to get up early and read our Bibles, and we're going to, we're going to build this rickety ladder filled with, uh, made of rungs of things that, that we're going to do and by our efforts, we're going to perfect our souls. We're going to keep the rules. We're going to work hard. And we're going to be perfected. And we're going to, we're going to be better Christians. You know, it's like uh, the, the little, one of the first little booklets, little flyers. We call those tracks. One of the first tracks I read about how to be, be a Christian, you know, talked about it was a football track. I love FCA. This is not to make fun of them. Uh, but... Uh, this tract was funny because it was all about football, right? And uh, you've failed. You've been failing. And so gee, God sends in the substitute, and Jesus goes in as a substitute, and you come sit on the bench, and he, 
He wins the game. That's, that's as good a model as any. But then what happens next week? Jesus is right back there on the bench, right? And now I'm in, and the Holy Spirit's the cheerleader, and he's over there raising, doing the yell, I'm sorry, yell leader. Uh, he's over there yelling for us, and, and he's going to give me the Spirit so that I don't need Jesus anymore, right? No. Uh, that idea that we're going to perfect ourselves through the works of the law, that just is a drastic underestimation of sin. If you think that all you needed was Jesus kind of to make you right, and now it's kind of up to you, and you're going to do the right thing and be the good guy, and, and you're not going to become a slave to sin anymore, you just don't get it. Our, our sin is deep in there. It's a deep cancer. Our sin is so deep that, that God himself, God himself had to come and, and bear its weight and bear its curse on the tree to remove it from us. The, the idea that you, you now can defeat sin with a little cheering on the sideline and, and some good hard effort, I mean, that's a, that makes a mockery of what God did on the cross. Like, he didn't really need to do that. And it just wildly underestimates the depth of your sin. You see, when you really begin to look at it, just like Martin Luther, right? Well, what? All I have to do is have pure motives. Okay, <laughs> that's all you have to do. Have you ever had one? No, never, not a single time. Because why do you want pure motives? Because I want to. <laughs> it's selfish. It's selfish. The, the desire to perfect ourselves with um, the, to perfect ourselves by our own efforts is a, is a selfish desire to to control, to hang on. We can't stand to not be in control. We want to be the God of our lives. It's, it foolishly underestimates the, the depth of sin to think we can perfect ourselves. And it foolishly underestimates the majesty of Christ. I mean, how good would you have to be to earn his approval? Um, I don't know what y'all do first thing in the morning. First thing I did do in the morning is hit, well, I do the Wordle, right? And then, um, and then I go to Google news and uh for whatever reason matthew perry's in the news today i don't know why i think he's talking about his addictions and uh he t he basically i don't know i didn't read the de i didn't read the article in great detail but he kind of links the beginning of his addictions to dating julia roberts and uh which is interesting because i think most guys would think that dating julia roberts would be pretty good you know that'd be that would be a good day uh, but he said this. He said, dating Julian Roberts uh, was too much for me. I had, I had been constantly certain that she was going to break up with me. Why would she not? I was not enough. I could never be enough. I, I think for the sensitive conscience, you, you get that. You understand that feeling about Jesus. I'm never going to be enough for God. I can never be enough. He's waiting for the excuse to break up with me. You can just never be enough. And that's, that's the, the slavery that a lot of us labor under, this, this fear that I'm just not going to measure up. And the good news is you're not ever going to measure up, but he's given it to you. The bad news is you've got to tear down everything you built to get it. What does Paul say? He talks about uh, trying, to, trying to justify himself by the law. He says, if I rebuild what I tear down, I prove myself to be a transgressor. That's in chapter 2, verse 18. And in uh, Philippians chapter 3, he says that all of his righteousness, all of his law keeping, his Sabbath keeping, his kosher food eating, his, uh, he said, I was, I was blameless under the law, and it's a trash heap. He's torn it down. He no longer takes pride in that. 
And that's hard. I don't know if you've ever had to tear down the works of your hands. <sighs> when I grew up, I grew up uh, out in the country, as I've told you many times. And um, like, if this were the, my mom's front porch, uh, before you got to that wall would be the highway. Uh, it was a major highway, the highway between Dresden and Palmersville. Uh, I'm sure you all traveled it many times. And, um, but it was a highway nonetheless. People drove fast on it. And living that close to the highway meant I got a new dog every year. Um, we had no fences, and, you know, dogs just lived under the house. That's where they lived, and eventually they would get run over, and we'd get a new one. And, um, but one year, dog gone it. We went through three, three dogs in one summer, and that third dog was going was to survive. And so we built her a pen. And, but having a pen meant that she had to have a, a doghouse because she was going to be out under the elements. And so I, my brother wouldn't help me build a doghouse at the very second I asked him to. So I went outside. I was going to build it myself. So I got this 12-foot uh, or 10-foot piece of siding, this, this uh, press board, worthless, painted on one side siding. Think, think uh, in your mind, really, 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 really thick cardboard. Uh, that's, that's what it was. And I had one piece of it. And so I did all the math, and I cut it into five pieces, each two feet long, and uh, I'd cut them with a pruning saw. Uh, those of you who know what a pruning saw is, laugh. That's not what they're designed for. And But I got it done, and I was bleeding, and I had worked so hard, and then I had no idea about, like, framing things up. And so I just put the nail at the very top, and I would just kind of get the, the side of the next piece right there where I could just get it into the side of it. And five pieces of wood, two on top, two on the sides, one on the back, bam, doghouse. Found a piece of trim board, painted the word princess on it. Bam, princess's doghouse. Take a step back, I have built the ugliest, most rickety, weakest, leakiest, water non-resistant, wind non-resistant, worst excuse of a doghouse ever known to man. And now I'm stuck. And my dog needs a doghouse. But I've worked so hard on this piece of junk. In order for her to get what she needs, I've got to tear it down. And, and that's where some of us are. Some of us, you may have spent a lifetime of amassing a resume that's going to impress the Lord. And you're realizing that it's not enough. You have not been enough. And in order for you to, to know his smile, to know the freedom, to have his righteousness, you've got to tear it down. And it's hard, but it's got to go. It's got to go. And once you're willing to do that, you receive the righteousness of Christ, the, the, the gospel way of, of growing in, in the gospel, the gospel way of, of becoming righteous is to receive, to rest in, and to rejoice in the righteousness of Christ that's put upon us. What does he say? He says it's imputed to us. Just as Abraham believed God, verse 6, and it was counted to him as righteousness. Counted to him. It was like accounting. A it's an accounting thing. It's a transaction. God takes the righteousness that God has, that Jesus has amounted, and He puts it in your your account. It's accounted to you. It's projected upon you. The righteousness of Christ projected upon you. And you're saying that's stupid, Ricky. How can I don't get that? Why would He do that? And 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 you you do get it. You get it. You just don't know you get it, right? Like right now, what are we what are we looking at? You're looking at a screen. It's got the gospel way of righteousness. It's got a car. She's holding her hands up. It looks like Thelma and Louise are about to go off the cliff. And um, nobody laughed at that in first service either. I, I thought it was funny. She's not really going to go off the cliff. And I really have never seen Thelma and Louise, but I thought that would be interesting. Okay. Um, that's what you see, right? What are you looking at? You're looking at a white screen. I know the screen is white. I've seen it many times. If we turn the projector off, you're going to see a white screen. But that's not what you see, right? You see the picture. You see the words. When, Christ, when God looks at us, we are sinners. We're justified sinners, according to Romans 4. 
He is looking at a sinner, but he is seeing the righteousness of Christ. And I know what you're saying. You're saying, but that doesn't make sense. That makes no sense. It makes absolute sense. I've done this exact same exchange twice in my life. Two complete strangers to me, right? Girls that I do not know. I know very little about them. All I know about them is the fake person they are when they're around their father-in-law, right? Nobody's a real person. You're not, you're not your real self around your father-in-law. Admit it. They married my sons. And when I see them, the, the love I have for my sons is imputed to them. So that when I see them, I see them as my, my own children, and I love them for nothing they've ever done. I don't even know what they've done. I see my love for my sons on them. And when you, by faith, when you receive the gospel, when you receive this good news we're talking about right now, God looks upon you, and he's, he's looking at a sinner, and he knows that. He's not a fool. But that's not what he sees. He sees his son. He sees the righteousness of his son on you. And if you want to know this freedom, this joy, if you want to be free from the, the slavery of, of trying to earn, earn approval. Look, you're, you can spend a million dollars going to counselors telling you that you need to stop earning approval. Sweet Matthew Perry in his little article said uh, he spent nine million dollars over the course of his life trying to get unaddicted. Um, you can do all you want to, to to stop trying to earn approval. You're never going to do it. I think you were designed to earn approval. What you can do is you can receive the approval of God and make that more important to you than anybody else's. Some of you are still trying to earn your mother's approval, your father's approval, or your own approval. You're trying to earn one of those. You're trying to say, I'm good enough because blank. And you're never going to get it. And those people aren't even thinking about you right now. But if you'll make God's approval of you more important than any of those, then you can rest and you can rejoice. That may not sound like a real thing. I, I mean, it is the, the realest thing there is. I, was, um, I went through the whole exercise this last week. I was walking. I was right outside on the other side of that wall, walking across the street. And uh, there's a little street over there that you can walk up and down. It's about a little less than a mile, nice little walk. And I was going over there to pray and to think through the sermon. And I just about got to this point when I just got overwhelmed with jealousy. Uh, you see, I have a friend. He and I are the same age. We've been, he's, he's one of my very first Christian friends. And we've done the exact same thing. We've both been campus ministers, both planted churches. And he has gotten every accolade that can be given, right? because he's a really good preacher. Uh, he's gotten to preach in Europe. He's preached in Asia. He's done all these things. And I was just bound up with jealousy. And then I started doing the, the, the worst thing you can do. I started beating myself up for being jealous. Right? Come on, you're better than that. That's a stupid spiral right there, man. I think you're just going down. And I stopped. And I remembered that God is smiling on me right now. Right now. He's not mad at me for being jealous. He just thinks I'm cute. He loves me. I'm in Jesus. And I started resting in that. I didn't have to drum up some emotion to be better than stronger than this jealousy. I just remembered and received and rested in the righteousness of Christ that is on me. I remember that God is smiling on me. And that makes me different. That, that works inside of me. It transforms me. That He is dealing with my sin. That He has got His arm around me. And I can, I can rest in that. You, you know what it means to rest in that? To stop living to earn approval. This is what I do many afternoons. Not every Sunday afternoon, but many. I go home, 
put on shorts, put on a t-shirt, take a nap. And at some point, I take a walk. And to take a walk, I don't change clothes into my cool walking clothes. I put on shoes. And I have socks that look like these. And I go walking in my shorts and in my green and white striped socks that are pushed down around my ankles and my white sweat-stained shirts. And you know why I do this? In public. Because I am already married. There is no one's approval out there I am seeking to gain. I'm resting in that love. Do you know what it means to rest? That you already have the Lord of the universe's approval. You already have it. Rest in that. Rejoice in that. That is true righteousness. That's real righteousness that can't be stained. Please pray with me. Uh, Father, we pray that you would show us the true freedom that comes. It comes only through receiving the righteousness of Christ. And Father, I don't know if there are people here who still have not received your spirit. And, and they hear all this and they think, I guess that's quaint. You just put on Jesus like a Halloween mask. And Father, it's not their fault they don't understand it, but I pray that they would, they would ask you for your spirit. I pray they would ask you for their spirit, your spirit today. pray that we would all rest in the righteousness of Christ today. And I pray that we would all rejoice in the righteousness of Christ now as we sing together. Amen. Now stand please as we begin to sing this beautiful song that was uh, co-written by Sandra McCracken who will be performing here uh, in a few weeks. And while they're doing that, we're doing that, the ushers are going to come forward and take up the offering. And this Sunday is a benevolent Sunday. We put the, uh, the envelopes out to remind you that we have a great benevolence offering that we, uh, people are very generous to give to. The problem is nobody ever receives it. Um, if you have an unexpected bill or, or an unexpected burden and you need help getting through it, please don't neglect uh, to let us serve you and minister to you by, by, by asking uh, we have plenty of money in it, and we have uh, not too many people receiving it. So please, um, you, please remember that offering if you or someone else has a need. Now let's worship the Lord.
In Matthew 22, Jesus tells the parable about a king who throws a feast, a wedding feast. And during the feast, he sees a man who is not wearing a wedding ga uh, garment. And so he goes up to the man and says, how did you get in here without a wedding garment? The man is speechless. And so the king tells this, his servants, throw this man out into the darkness. Now, why does Jesus tell us that parable? It's not to tell us about the importance of having the right thing on at a wedding. It, it's a spiritual parable about the kingdom of heaven. That in order to get to heaven, in order to get to the marriage supper of the Lamb, that we have to have uh, the wedding gown with the garment of faith, uh, the imputed righteousness of Christ. And the Lord's Supper is a picture of that wedding feast that feast that God is throwing for us. And what that parable tells us is that we can't come dressed however we want, bringing our own stuff. We don't deserve to come. As William Money says, deserves got nothing to do with it. It's only by grace that we come and by trusting in Jesus to get us there. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we are grateful that... You do not leave us to our own devices, to our own efforts, but you sent your only Son to be our righteousness, to be our salvation, and to give his life on the cross, to take our sin on himself and to give us his righteousness. And now we come to this table, we come to you uh, with nothing in our hands we bring, simply to the cross we cling gratitude for your grace. The Lord Jesus, in the night when he was betrayed, took bread and after giving thanks, he broke it. He said, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. After the supper, he also took a cup and said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. And now as often as you eat this bread and you drink this cup, you do proclaim the Lord's death until he returns. Christ has died, Christ has risen, and Christ is coming again. Until he comes, we do eat and drink with faith, knowing that his return is imminent, and knowing that he is with us until he comes. And so Christ is given to us, the body of Christ, take and eat. the wine of the new covenant take and drink and now as our elders and their helpers go to the four tables around the room we want to invite you to come to the table to celebrate this sacramental mystery with us if you are a believer in Jesus Christ if you have come to him in faith and asked him to save you then you are invited to come to this table celebrate with us. Uh, if you need prayer, Josh and I will be in the back and would love to pray for you. And now when you are ready, please come.
so much for coming. I'm looking forward to getting to know you better. I'll be in the uh, youth building at the other end of the parking lot with a pizza in my hand. If you want a piece, come over and uh, join us. And if, uh, if you, I don't get a chance to say anything else to you today, at least let me give you God's word of blessing before you go. May the God of all hope fill you with all joy and all peace as you go on believing that by the power of His Holy Spirit, you might overflow with hope. Amen.